This morning, I want to do three things with you in the time that we've got together. I want to talk about some background to Amos. I want to talk about certain passages within Amos, and then we'll have our points for home because Dale Hearn has taught us we have to do that before we leave, and it's a great thing to do. By the way, special shout out to Jersey Village. Uh, they watch this uh, while this is going on, and I'm not able to teach at that campus anymore except through virtual teaching, and uh, I miss being there, and that occurs to me as well as I'm going through this. Now, let's get back to the bookshelf, and let's take Amos off the shelf and open it up. The book of Amos is an important book, and it begins with the words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. And I think it's important that we talk about the background to this book, and I want to do it in two ways. I want to put it into its historical context, context but I also want to put it into its cultural context. And if we explore that, my goal is, as we read through these books, these Old Testament minor prophets, which is um, probably an offensive term, minor only in the sense, as David said, that they're smaller, not that they're of any less importance. But as we read through them, I'd like them to become something more than bizarro books we don't understand. I'd like for them to become something that's, that's digestible, but also something where we recognize that these were books written at a time when people were people. Because we're all people. One of my buddies, Louis Miori, one of his favorite sayings is people are people and the church is full of them. And he's right. People are people. And they were people back then. And the things you and I struggle with, the things you and I rejoice in, the things that bring us happiness, the things we strive for, they may translate culturally into a different face, but the, the, the drive, the, the, the heart is still the same. And so I want this to become something where we can maybe even relate to it. And for that to happen, we need to understand the context in which these books were delivered. So let's start with the historical context. These are slides you've seen before with a few changes and tweaks, but I want it to be fresh in your brain. I'd like this to be so good in your brain that you're able to stand up here and teach it or that David and I can forget our computers and you'll still have it. So here we go. This is the world. If we want to look at the world in the 8th century B.C., and it's so interesting, I get questions on this when we go to worship. The 8th century B.C., 8th century B.C., means the 700s B.C. All right? You got it? It's, it's a weird thing, but that's because from the birth of Christ, which is the B.C., you go backwards, and the first 100 years to 100 years B.C. is the first century. From there to 200 B.C. is the second. From there to 300 is the third. And so from 700 to 800 is the 8th century B.C., all right? So we're in the 8th century B.C., the 700s B.C., before Christ. This is the time when the Olympic Games were just starting in Greece. This is the time where Rome was founded as a city, traditionally. Though it's interesting, if you are keeping track of time at the birth of Jesus, time in the Roman world was registered from AUC, from the founding of the Urbis, the city of Rome. So that happens in the 700s, the 8th century BC. Homer writes in the 700s, the 8th century BC, and that's the story of the Odyssey. That's the story of the Iliad. 
Um, uh, this is also the time period of Jonah and the whale, the prophet Jonah. And so if we go back and we understand that, then we can concentrate a little more fully on what's going on in the area that's relevant to Israel. Israel is not yet sending teams to the Olympic Games, so we don't care as much about the Olympics. And we don't know of any Israelis that are headed over to uh, Rome to help uh, Romulus and Remus and the foundations of Rome. But we do know what's going on with Egypt, uh, or with the, the areas relevant to Israel. To the north is the Assyrian Empire mega empire been around for centuries and centuries and centuries it's kind of like an amoeba it, it blob shape changes its boundaries depending upon who it's fighting and who it's beating or who's beating it but you've got the massive assyrian empire and you've got a massive egyptian empire that's been around for centuries and centuries and that's true even if we chart back to the time of abraham but let's start with about 1500 B.C. And if we go back to 1500 B.C., we've got this situation. And then in between those empires are kind of more tribal, but it's not actually as tribal all the way. Some of them are tribes, but these smaller little groups that form their own little kingdom, if you will, uh, but, but they're really, really small podunky. I mean, it's almost too much to call them a kingdom compared to the Assyrian Empire and the Egyptian Empire. But you've got decent-sized cities that have set up here and, and a government that's been formed around those with a leader. So that's where we are in the 1500s. Now somewhere, depending upon how you date things, between 1450 and 1250 B.C., out of Egypt comes Moses with the Israelites and he takes them out of bondage and I'm a late date guy so I think this is in the 1250s and during the time of Ramesses II. He takes, he takes Israel and God moves around and the people, the other areas of, of smaller collective governments and God places Israel in the promised land. He gives them Cana. And so Canaan is where they are, and, and you have that. Now, by the time we roll into 1000 to 962, we have the reign of King David. So Moses is gone, but David has got a kingdom, and it expands. It's pretty good size. He establishes, he conquers Jerusalem. Israel had not conquered Jerusalem before this. So it's King David that finally consolidates and conquers Jerusalem it's King David that wants to build a temple in Jerusalem to God but at the time of King David God is still worshipped here and there and here and there specifically generally comes down to a couple of locations most of the time but the pursuit is still after worshiping God in the presence of his tabernacle that that was part and the 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 What's the word I'm looking for? The Ark of the Covenant. Thank you. The Ark of the Covenant, wherever it may be. So you've got David. David wants to build the house, but God says, no, you've shed too much blood. You can't build the house. I'm going to let your son build it. And so when he passes on in 962 B.C., his son Solomon builds the temple. And it's a grand temple. And so if we look at this and we understand his son builds the temple, then his son is running the government until, and, and this happens once David dies in 962. <laughs> Thank you. I thought that was pretty good. I thought, how do I show David died? Easy. David dies, 962, his son Solomon takes over, and Solomon starts building the temple. Solomon exacts a lot of taxes to do all of these different works that Solomon does. And it's really hard on the people. Solomon's a good king in some ways, but uh, as uh, Janet Seifert emailed me this week, these people are all way too human and way too like us. 
he's got some mega downfalls. So uh, 922, he dies. And when he dies, something happens that's profound. He's got a son named uh, Rehoboam. I always get Jeroboam and Rehoboam. I have to make sure I get it right. Rehoboam is the son. Um, and, and, and so you've got basically Israel as it exists is really fragmented into the northern and the southern end. And Judah, Jerusalem has become the center of worship because that's where the temple was built. And so everybody's ordered, you go, that's the house of the Lord. And God made his presence known there. And so that's where everybody's supposed to worship. Meanwhile, in the northern places that's a little bit far, you know, they didn't have cars back then. Travel was not easy, especially for the ordinary families. So they're still worshiping in all these other different locations and sites. And they're thinking, why should we be going down there? So some wise people go up to Solomon's son and they say, hey, your dad was really tough on us with taxes and harsh labor. Are you going to be tough on us or are you going to lighten up? And the old wise people tell Rehoboam, hey, go light on him. This will be a chance to bond and consolidate that kingdom. But the young Turks say to him, oh no, you say you think my dad was tough on you. You ain't seen tough. My dad was, was nothing compared to what I'm going to be. He was a tap, tap, tap. I'm a sledgehammer. And so that's what Rehoboam says. And so the northern tribes just said, see ya. And they break off with a, a, a king that they designate Jeroboam. And so at this point in time, you've got what scholars today call the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom that's not what they called themselves back then back then the northern kingdom would be called Samaria at times because Samaria it was a, 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 a city where the king would reside often and where a lot of the leadership came from they would also be called Israel because they heavens they had like most of the tribes They'll be called the house of Jacob at times. They'll be called a number of different things, but, but mainly Samaria and Israel. I just generally refer to them as the northern kingdom because they're the northern kingdom. And that means you've also got the southern kingdom. But they didn't call themselves the southern kingdom any more than Samaria called itself the northern kingdom. They would call themselves typically Judah because that was the major tribe that was there. And that was the major source. It is the southern kingdom, Judah, from whence came the house of David, which continued to reign on the throne. The house, by the way, through whom was promised the Messiah. So the southern kingdom of Judah is down here. The northern kingdom of Samaria is up here. And Amos is from the southern kingdom. He's from Judah. And that becomes very important when we read the book. So if we read the book and understand this, the minor prophets that we're talking about here, Amos, is somewhere between 780 and 750 B.C. 8th century. Somewhere between 780 and 750 and we date that by who the kings were. You've got Jeroboam II, who's the king in the northern kingdom. And you've got Uzziah, who's the king in the southern kingdom. So with that, let's look for a moment at Amos' resume. Amos, occupation. He says, I am technically a breeder of cattle, sheep and oxen perhaps, as a boker. I'm headquartered out of Tekoa, Judah, where I'm generally found among the shepherds, which is where you'd expect a breeder to be. He's a, he, 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 you know, breeding is something that some people back then had as a specialty. They were able to, to, 
they, they didn't have the genetic knowledge we have. I don't think they had IVF and things of that nature for cattle. But, but even still today, you will find among cattle breeders uh, a, 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 a strand of vets and other people who specialize in trying to figure out how to bring out the best strains, how to make sure that the best bulls mate with the best heifers so that they can produce the best offspring. And it's something that, that is... Uh, uh, attentive and it's also to, to have someone who's present during birthing a process uh, is is helpful so he does this type of work now that's seasonal work in some ways so he's got another job as well he says I also have a side business I travel as a consultant and a dresser of figs sycamore figs it's the kind of fig where it will ripen better if you put a slit in it in the right place at the right time. You get a juicier, riper, better fig. Now, figs aren't a big thing in Tekoa. They didn't really, they, they, they didn't grow a lot of figs there. So this is a traveling business for him. He's a man who's used to traveling. And that becomes important because most people back then did not travel far from home. But he not only in his shepherding business or sheep breeding business, oxen breeding business, Boker is generally an ox, and when he called, calls himself a Boker, people think he's probably dealing with that type of breeding more so than sheep, but it can be sheep as well. And so uh, uh, he's out there, but he also is a traveling fella. You say, well, what's the big deal about traveling? I traveled to church today. It's a huge deal before you have a car. It's a huge deal before you have money that you can spend in all these different places. It's a huge deal before Bucky's. It's a huge, well, where are you going to get your beef jerky? It's a huge deal when you don't have a standard police force who's out there to make sure you don't get robbed on the road because you're having to carry cashola. You're having to carry things to barter with. Traveling was not something that was easily taken, especially by individuals. If you're going to travel, you travel en masse. You get a band together, a caravan together, and you go that way. I Go back in American heritage. When, when the, the Europeans were settling the United, what is now the United States of America, and they would venture forth and go west, young man, very few people just said, hey, I think I'll go by myself. They would take a caravan for safety and security, if nothing else. I mean, you, you, it, you, you just don't have traveling as a problem. But this guy's a traveler. He's prepared for this. So that's his resume. That gives you some historical context. Let me give you some cultural context. And for the cultural context, we're going to look a little bit at the book of Amos. So get it back off the shelf and let's open it up. But understand here what's going on in the northern kingdom and what's going on in the southern kingdom. This is part of the cultural context. The northern kingdom at the time of Jeroboam II is actually pretty prosperous. It's doing quite well. And if you had come over on a boat and you had landed and gone to the divide. Hold on, let's get that boat back here. There. If you had landed... And you get the divide. And you can go right and go to Judah. Or you can go left and go to Israel, the northern kingdom. Which one are you going to? Well, I can tell you if you were basing it upon the king, you'd have signs up. And the sign would say, evil, go north. Good, go south. Because the north king is an evil king. And the country may be prosperous, but the country is not godly. Let me give you some passages that will help you get this. Oh, I hope it doesn't do that every time. That's driving me crazy. Uzziah, or if you were going to call him his name in Hebrew, it'd be Uzoyah. Uzoyah. Uzziah. Zia. I guess that's an E sound. Uziah, 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 because you'd have to pronounce the yah at the end in that way. Uziah. Who wants to call him Uziah? 
His name's Uzziah or Uzziah. But if he wouldn't know who you were talking to. That's like if we called Jesus Jesus, he wouldn't know who you were talking to except he's divine. Because that's not even remotely how even the Greek was pronounced, much less how his name was pronounced, which was a Hebrew name. But old King Uzziah is king of Judah. And um, Yeravam, or Jeroboam, is king of uh, Israel. Now we call him uh, Jeroboam II, or Yaravam II, because there was an earlier Jeroboam that was the king during the divided kingdom. So we've got two Jeroboams, common name. So this is concerning Israel. So you've got Amos living in the southern kingdom of Judah where Uzziah is king. But he's given a prophecy about the northern kingdom where Yarav Am is the king. And the, the, the prophecies need to be understood that way. Now there's a little bit here that will apply to Judah and a little bit there that will apply to Judah. But by and large, this is a prophecy to the northern kingdom. And so within the framework of that, let's see a couple of things that you need to know about. Now, the kingdom had been prosperous lately. Assyria, that northern king, that, that kingdom north of Israel, Assyria has had a lot of internal struggles. They've been having to fight neighboring tribes and peoples. And so they've really turned their attention away from Israel. And if you look at what uh, uh, Jeroboam has done, he's been able to expand Israel in its size. He's been able to go up and conquer into Damascus and into Hamath and, and these areas. The rest, if you read it in 2 Kings, it says, the rest of the acts of Yeravam and all that he did and his might, how he fought, how he restored Damascus and Hamath to Judah and Israel. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So he's successful on the battlefield. And he reigns for decades and decades, a long time. And when you don't have to pay tribute to the Assyrians and you're bringing in success by conquering other people, you can get slaves, and all of a sudden, economic prosperity really elevates. Um, if you go to Costa Rica, Costa Rica is a country in Central America, and if you ever go there, they have a, a literacy rate that rivals the United States of America and at times has exceeded it. They have health care for everyone, national health care. They have amazing infrastructure. They have um, recycling bins and did uh, uh, Doug and, and Celia and Becky and I were down there, I don't know, 10 years ago? I don't know when it was. But they have recycling bins. They, I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is incredibly, um, they, they do incredibly well there in terms of modernity, being modern. And one of the reasons why is because in the early 1900s, they made a treaty with the United States of America. And the treaty was... If they get attacked, or if there's a military problem, the U.S. will defend them. And they will be faithful to the U.S. That's the deal. And as a result, they've never had to spend all this money on a military. So they've taken all that money and poured it into the country and into the people. To amazing success. What, what can happen economically when you are at peace is an opportunity for economic prosperity that's different than when you're having to pay a foreign government heavy taxation, when you're having to pay uh, a foreign government, when, when people are coming in and marauding your people and taking away your crops and taking away all your problems. It, it, 
it, it's a huge economic aspect to the country. And so during this time, there was great fruit in a 40-year reign. Scott Callahan's not here this week, or I'd just have him come stand up here wearing that shirt that he had that looked like it had fruit on it. But there was great fruit in a 40-year reign. I mean, before, most of the houses are made out of unbaked mud brick. But with 40 years of prosperity, your houses can be made out of hewn stone. And now all of a sudden, with 40 years of prosperity, you've got a king. And at least the king and a bunch of the rich people, they've got a winter home and they've got a summer home. And Amos references this. He'll talk about, I'm going to strike the winter house along with the summer house. And the houses of ivory. Now that doesn't mean they built their houses out of ivory. Houses of ivory are referencing houses where ivory is used as a significant decorative element. Houses of ivory shall perish. And the great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. The fruit of a 40-year reign provided a massive divide between the rich and the poor. This was a massive problem at the time of Amos. Amos 6, 4 through 6 is too large to put on the screen. So let me do it to here. Amos 6, 4 through 6. Look at what he says. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory, who stretch themselves out on their couches, who eat lambs from the flock. You say, well, I thought they all ate lambs from the flock. Oh, no, not the poor people. Meat was eaten, even by wealthy people, meat was a rare treat. It wasn't uh, an every, you know, three meal, they, they did not eat paleo. Eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. Calves? That's veal. They don't even wait for the cow to get old, man. They're killing the young. That's how wealthy they are. They've got cattle in abundance. And remember, a cattle breeder ought to know the significance of what God's put in his mind. Who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music who drink wine by the bowl full and anoint themselves with the finest oils but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph the 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 idea there is the 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 things that aren't going so well the, those things that are, are destructively affected by everything. Therefore, they'll be the first of those who go into exile. And he goes on. But, but this, is, this, is, this is the problem. And it's not just uh, uh, Amos 6. I want to show you Amos 2.6. It's repeated in Amos 8.6 or same reference in Amos 8.6 to show you where the poor are on this. You've got the rich lying back on their couches singing inane songs while they drink wine by the bowl full and eat meat like it's going out of style. That's the rich. Look at the poor. Amos 2.6. Thus says the Lord. For three transgressions of Israel and for four I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They're trafficking in human flesh. The needy are so poor they get sold for a pair of good shoes. Someone said to me this morning when I was walking in, I said, I like your shoes. Where'd you get them? So I don't know. 
But you may like these shoes. They're not worth a human person. They're not worth a slave. That's the divide between the rich and the poor. Now, what I've given you then is the background, both historical and contextual. Now, I'd like to look at a couple of passages that we've got some time for, and then we'll resume with this again in two weeks, because I want to spend more time in Amos. So, let's go to Amos 1, verse 2. God's, uh, Amos uh, gets sent north. He's, he's, on, look, he, he's on a vacation, not... He has to travel to the northern kingdom to say these things. And here's what he starts out with. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. Carmel is a mountain down in Judah, the southern kingdom. Now I suspect most everybody in here and probably most people who watch this on the internet are um, familiar with C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, uh, famous for a number of different books, but among those, especially within the secular world where his fame is perhaps greatest, it's the Chronicles of Narnia. And in the Chronicles of Narnia, he tells an allegory of children as they grow up in a make, not a make-believe, but in, a, in another land, in another reality. And in that other reality, that other land, Narnia, you have a, a, a figure that's typical of Jesus, of God. And that figure is Aslan, the lion. And if you read about this in the books, you'll find over and over in a number of different books something akin to what I pulled out of the last battle. Do you think I keep Aslan, God, in my wallet? Fools, said Tyrium. Who am I that I could make Aslan appear at my bidding? He's not a tame lion. And this is repeated throughout the books. He's not a tame lion. He goes where he will. He does what he chooses. And the voice of Aslan is a roar at times in the Chronicles of Narnia. And I've never had a chance to talk to C.S. Lewis. I was, I think, two when he died. Um, uh, and uh, mom... I'm sure if anybody could have pulled off me having a chance to visit with him, it would have been you, but uh, I don't think uh, uh, that was in, in our life at the time. He's not a tame lion. That, I'm convinced, is something C.S. Lewis grabbed from Amos. The Lord roars. Sha'og is the Hebrew word for roar. Sha'og, roar like a lion that's what he's saying he's using a lion's roar to reference what message is coming out God's message that he that is being proclaimed is not something that's just some quiet little drip from a leaky faucet no God's message is not some meandering river that's just going to go where it flows with no intent and no purpose. No. God's message cannot be ignored. It is the roar of a lion. One of the most fearsome sounds in that day that you're going to experience if you're out in the countryside. Certainly among the shepherds. Certainly among the cattle breeders, among the agricultural workers. You just don't want, you say, well, wait a minute, just get your gun out. You don't have one. Tranquilizer. No, you don't have those either. I mean, how many of you really want to go face to face with a roaring lion and I'll give you a knife. 
Mel gave me a pocket knife one time. It's a beautiful knife. I'll give you that. You want to go one-on-one with a lion? The roar of a lion is not to be ignored. It's to be appreciated and it is to be feared. Aslan is not a tame lion. But there's something stunning here that I hope we don't lose sight of. We are part of a vast universe. The universe has more galaxies than scientists can count. We have no clue how many there are. The estimates vary by the trillions and trillions, depending upon who you're reading. And those are galaxies. We're in the Milky Way galaxy. By the way, that's a reconstruction. You can't be in the Milky Way galaxy and step out and take a picture of it like this. This has got some computer work. But we're in one of these outer fringe bands. And we've got a solar system that goes around our sun. And around our sun, we're on this little dirt clod called Earth. Earth is like a peanut compared to a basketball compared to the larger planets in our solar system. And on this little dirt clod, on this little uh, uh, planet, uh, in, in this little solar system, in this little galaxy, tucked away in this vast universe... God deigns to take one small little part of the world, Israel, and roar a message like a lion. And I got news for you, news that Amos didn't necessarily even have a clue about. God not only did that, but he secured that message so that you and I would have it in our Bibles for us to read right now. 2,700 years later. Which brings up the question, am I listening? <laughs> There's a message here for me to hear. Am I listening? The text continues. Thus says the Lord... For three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire. Now, you may remember when I was reading about the selling the poor for a pair of sandals, or buying them, um, it had that same three, four, three, four, three, four. It's a poetic rhythm that's followed throughout this but I gotta tell you I'm I'm like a math guy I love math okay is it three or is it four I would like to know thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Damascus and for four well which is it which is it three or four well let's read and find out I will not revoke the punishment because, here it is, they threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. Well, that's one. Is it three? Is it four? Is it one? Or maybe it's one that they did three or four times. Let me urge you not to think like you're taking the SAT math section again. Let's go back culturally for a moment and understand numbers were used in a much fuller way than simply counting an algebra. In that era and in that time, numbers served multiple duties. And so the number three was always associated, always is too harsh a word, was associated with the divine, with the heavenlies. The number three is a divine number. You'll see this in other biblical texts. You'll see it even through into the New Testament in the book of Revelation. Holy, holy, holy 
is the Lord God Almighty, right? Three holies, holy, holy, holy. And then is who? The Lord God Almighty. Three of those. What else? Who was and is and is to come. Three again. And you'll see three used in that passage how many times? Three times. So it's the three, three, three. Three. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Three, three, three. Three. It's a divine number. Four is a very earthly number. You have four directions of the earth, north, south, east, and west. You got four elements. There's fire, water, um, air, and what did I leave out? Earth. Fire, water, earth, and air. Yeah, four elements in, in the thought process back then. Four corners of the earth. You got the four winds of the earth. Four is a very earthly number. So if we're thinking in these terms, and we read about this listing of sins, we're going to see for three that sin offends heaven. And for four, sin offends the earth. And God's judgment is one that's going to come, not just in heaven but on earth so that's what you get in a passage like this thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Damascus and for four I will not revoke the punishment because they've threshed Gilead three four because of what it means to heaven and because of what it means on earth I'm not going to put up with this And these are what they call transgressions, pesha, transgressions. A transgression is rooted in the, the pesha is rooted in a word for rebellion. And so it can be used in the sense of rebellion on earth against the law. You know, speeding, you rebelled, you peshed. But it's also used in terms of our rebellion against God. Jared's going to be preaching on the proto euangelion, the, 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 the first proclamation of the gospel in the story after the rebellion, the transgression of Adam and Eve. Pesha is rebellion. This is a rebellion on earth, but also in heaven. All right, do we have time for, no, we don't have time for the next passage. So here's what you don't get. My Rocky Three reference. We're going to have to do it. Uh, uh, I'll try to consider doing it next week. But uh, what we need to do right now is we need to, to jump to here. Oh, no, week after next. Thank you, Brent. Um, points for home. We can't, we can't leave these. You and I live on a timeline. I mean, think about that. God's timeline didn't end with the end of the Bible. We're still on that timeline. We're still on that little dirt clod in outer space. God's still got a message. And it's not simply the message of Amos. It's Holy Scripture. And so I really need to ask myself this question, and I routinely ask myself this question. Do I hear the word of the Lord? Look at the way I put the question. Do I hear the word of the Lord? Oh, I can hear it. I can listen to it, I can read it, but do I hear it? Do I take it in? Do I find what it says, not about my neighbor, but what it says about me? Do I find not what someone else needs to pay attention to, but me? Not what America needs to do, but me. Not what Putin needs to do, but me. Am I hearing the word of God? I'm not saying it's not relevant to everybody. It is. I'm not saying it's not relevant to the international scene. It is. I'm not saying it's not relevant to our country and our culture. It is. But I need to ask myself what I have most control over is, is I, am I hearing it for me? 
Because God, the roaring lion, doesn't simply roar for everybody else. And if I don't listen to that roar myself, heaven help me. Next. How do we know? You know, we exist on a timeline. God's word is there. How do we know if we're listening to it? If I'd gotten to the other passages, and when I get to the other passages, God willing, a lot of it has to do with whether or not we walk a road of arrogance or a road of humility. When we read those passages, Janet, that you emailed me about, do we read those and say, yikes, that's me? Or do we read those and say, thank you, God, that I'm not like those cretins over there? Because people are people. And nobody's got any basis to be anything other than humble in the presence of the Almighty God. All right. Thank you for listening. Let me give you a word of blessing before we go. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask your blessing upon all who hear this message that we will attune our ears to hear you speak to us. That it will affect the way we live on our timeline. And that we will come to you and, and, and be present in our lives in a condition of absolute humbleness before you, seeking to exalt you only in our lives. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.